Ah, draft physics video. I'm doing some of the starting the preliminaries of the laser experiment anyway, going out that window. It's kind of neat from the target. You can actually see the laser, which is pretty good. So I got another little tripod. I have to have to make an electronic switch for this. And uh well, I have to just splice a couple of wires. Anyway, so um I figure I'll it's, uh, you know, it's wet out. You can s kind of see the beam, which is kind of neat. Um, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't spread as much as I thought, diverge. And uh, it does magnify, you know, any kind of defect you put in front of the laser, which is sort of interesting. All right, well, you can't see it too much there. I don't think you can see it all there. So we have to kind of be on the other side of it. So I can barely see it on the side of a tree over there. Just walked through the beam. But you should be able to see it. Yeah, you should be able to see this. Take this thing off. See if you can see that. I don't know, it's quite clear to me. <laughs> can you see that? I think you can see that. Yeah, I think the line is there. Green line right here. So, kind of neat. Yeah. Pretty cool. Should shine it right into the camera and see what happens, right? Yeah, that would be a cool experiment. So that part's pretty neat. So let's go find it out here on the tree and see where it is angular wise. Put the lens back on. Um, so I intend to talk about some of the two slit experiment really. This is just like I said for the purpose of uh, I have to walk around all this crap. <laughs> so anyway, now this will be fun. The next few weeks I can do this bullshit and get Lyme disease again. Hey, a cardinal. It's kind of a nice bird for the woods. Um, and big giant woodpeckers have been around. So maybe I can find a tree even further away to put a mirror on. See, I thought it was hitting a bigger tree. It's only hitting a little tiny tree. But I can always put a target out here. This is... An interesting hole. <laughs> yeah, that is really cool. Did you see that? Yeah. Never really saw it rot on the inside like that. Uh, tree looks almost dead though. Oh, it's gone. Where's the beam? I lost it. <laughs> it was right here. Oh, there it is. It's hiding. This water shouldn't be here. Um. Anyway. Uh. Yeah, I kind of thought I was hitting that tree, and I'm barely hitting it. I ended up hitting this little one. But really, that isn't terrible. Uh, two inches at about 300 feet, something like that. Uh, yeah, I'd say 100 yards. So you can really see that beam quite well. Let's take this off. should be able to see that anyway. I didn't think it would show up that good. So, very visible. So it'd be nice if I had a, I mean, maybe I will go down to the park and find a clear field and see if I don't get arrested for doing some kind of evil experiment. But, um, you know, then I should be able to shoot it, you know, 500 feet easy. Maybe a thousand. Anyway, so I might be able to get through here. Yeah, so this looks like a path. So if I cut these weeds out of here, I should get a bit further. Let's see if I hit that big tree. That's about the last good big tree to cut in there. And then I'm getting close to the neighbors over there. Might not want me cutting in their woods. But anyway, mm -hmm. worth doing. Uh, mostly. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, the commenters and you know, it's people who want to say my alternative theory is nothing or. Um, crazy or uh, doesn't make sense or any of that crap. It's just useless. The tr fact is that it does explain the phenomenon and um, you know that's the that's what you're supposed to be after is an explanation. You're supposed to be. God, getting too old. <laughs> I want like the wheelchair friendly path. I don't know what this shit is. 
It's on the other side of the trench. Uh, this is one of my contemplating chairs. Back in the day when I contemplated looking over the trench. Um, thought we should put it someplace else. More contemplatory. So, uh, yeah, so you can see that pretty well. I like the interesting. So I'll be able to see, you know, maybe different kind of weather, what kind of beam effects you get. So, another good experiment. Lots of subjects this whole, I want to try polarizing the beam also. Uh, different ways of tuning, you know, the whole Brewster angle thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm figuring you get light more in phase, likely. Um, because of my theory of polarization, anyway, you're selecting polarizations and a little different. So, anyway, doable. You know, I'll put a mirror out there and bounce it back. Uh, double doable. Okay, turn that off. Alright. So, back to the regularly scheduled video presentation. I would edit it, but I don't feel like gluing the videos together. Um, if it goes over a half an hour, it's a big hassle. <laughs> so I usually go over a half an hour, so I don't want the big hassle. Oh, crappy rain today, and weather's cold, and might as well do some gardening videos, though. Greenhouse is doing very well. <laughs> yeah, I'll do gardening on the, on the draft physics video. Just to point out, I haven't been doing nothing. I have to do all this work. I've been... They're selling the property, blah, blah, blah. And I have to keep up with the garden. See, look at it in there. Very nice. Lots of stuff growing. But the weather's been suck. Yeah, May has been suck. Yeah, it's going to get worse this week. It's all cold. And not good. Can't plant anything in the ground. It's going to be too cold. Everything get killed or stunted or ruined, degraded in some manner. See, like if we end up with a frost this week, all that shit's in trouble. Anyway, I think that's enough. Cat is a little desperate to get in. <laughs> Cats don't like this kind of weather. Nope, nope, nope. Keep going to the door, expecting it to get better. But I mean, I really wanted to plant my tomatoes, but I can't. So, it's going to get too cold. And I'll ruin them, mostly. Hey, get in your chair. All right, now, to continue. So, um, it's mostly going to be double slit stuff, I think. So I did make myself a little cheap double slit toy thing. And but I haven't I gotta get better light sources. I'm gonna try some. I have this ultraviolet flashlight stuff and I actually bought some LEDs, ultraviolet. And see, and uh, it's kind of it's kind of neat how Chinese paper really glows. See that paper down there? It's Chinese paper. <laughs> really glows. It's anything from China glows. Mostly. Um so I did make myself this little, you know, for the purpose of uh, double slitting. And, oh, I lost the, I forgot my browser crashed. Uh, I, well, it didn't crash, the Internet Explorer crashed. But anyway, I did uh, take some photos of the actual slits, which is kind of good for me. So it's paper, but it's, and it doesn't even look slippery, but it has this almost plastic look. But, you know, it's not a perfect edge here, so I'm going to try to just rub another piece of paper against the edges. See if I can get a cleaner edges. Uh, but it's about a millimeter thick barrier. So the slits are about, you know, much less than half to start with. But they're adjustable, see, so I can move them, make them wider and such. So I'll try it with the... I might try the red laser because it seems to work a little better than the good green one. But we'll see how that goes. So I'm working on it, is the point. Um, so the thing I really wanted to talk about, though, is, uh, you know, people... Well, people's snarky remarks are just so useless. Um, 
I mean, they just provoke anger and um, pisses me off. And you know, and I, I know you think I'm guilty of some crime because what what I, what I have done, in the sense of saying I think Einstein was incorrect. I don't think it's a correct theory of the force of gravity. I don't think it's created by a magical bent anything. I, I think it's an actual force. Um, I think magnetism is an actual force. It doesn't create virtual photons. It creates actual force tons, whatever you want to call them, um, tons. They're just not as detectable as light. Or they're what we traditionally call part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But they exist. And the same tons are the ones responsible for gravity. And because they're not um, typical electron-based tons, yeah, well, they are sort of. I mean, quite obviously in magnetism, they affect electrons quite dramatically. <laughs> see, see, I mean, all they do is not, they're not affect them the way you're used to, which is the electron creates another ton, um, a, a photon, a something you can see. And if you can't see it, then you're going to claim it doesn't exist. And it's just not very bright. So, I don't know, I, I, I should get to this Jesse guy first, but, uh, I mean, I really shouldn't get to him first, actually, because the Marvels guy is more relevant to this subject at the moment. Well, his, his comments are older, so I might as well get to it. Uh, more, more relevant to this idea of blocking this part of the slit and, um, you know, what, what these people think the pattern should be. Uh, so he quotes me, <coughs> saying, um, you would expect the movie to show up here, just smaller, and it would show up here bigger, and the, anyway, especially with photons, because their wavelength is so small, the interference will start happening at a millimeter from the slits. So my argument is, see, I, you know, what he's not getting is I don't think his theory has any explanation for his own experimental results. The idea is, so let's understand that this always has to be applicable to one photon at a time going through. So let's understand that the theory is that one photon comes to the slits, okay, it's, it's Huygens, <clears throat> which means it's turned into these flat waves, this flat photon, let's call it a flat photon for whatever purpose, but a flat photon comes towards the slits, and apparently the ones that hit the middle don't, aren't affected by this rule. But anyway, the ones that go through the slit, they go through both the slits, create round waves, all right, and that the round waves create an interference pattern. So if I can draw it reasonably correct. Um, so everybody, we, we know this part, right? And we know that the interference pattern will be basically, if I just drew it as this being an arc, it would be this, okay? Dark spots will show up and between the light spots. So peak bright, peak dark, peak bright, peak dark, peak... So, you know, sine wave, however you want to draw it. Peaks and valley and peaks and valley. So that's what it's going to do. It's going to create this fan. Now, he puts a barrier in here, and my argument is, is this wavelength is so small, the distance between these Huygens waves is so small, that by the time you get just centimeters away, you already have, this pattern has already developed, this fan has already been created. And so all you're really doing if you move the screen is you're just changing where it gets displayed. So a screen far away, the bands are far apart, the screen close, the bands are closer together. That's the difference. Now, somewhere in here there's some communication problem, I guess. I was thinking the same thing, but that's completely wrong. I took a pic just during the night. Okay, the camera is really bad and does not represent what I saw with my own eyes, but this is the best I could do just from today. I redid it again. This sounds like the old comment. I thought I dealt with this one. Uh, but anyway, so here's, maybe this one was done a day later, so maybe we'll deal with this one. Let's get another thing straight. Longer wavelength equals more diffraction. Now, that's where I'll disagree. So let's say that the wavelength is longer 
all it really means is that the the places where there'll be interference will be further apart so the, the bands will be different so the bright and dark spots will be wider so if blue light the dark bands and light bands will be closer together but what's really interesting is this distance the distance of what's visible so if we, we said the visible pattern is this wide that always seems to be consistent so no matter what so so if you had blue you'd get more dots inside of that absolute pattern and with red you'd get fewer on offs but it's always going to end up being within this context this distance and it always seems to fade at the same point <clears throat> fade visibly that's why i'd like somebody to do this with photographic film and see if there's actually any anything happening on those fringes you know beyond the beyond the visible pattern so anyway um all right less spreading so you know the lower the wavelength i mean the bigger the wavelength the the less see the shorter the wavelength equals less spreading but i mean it's not less diffraction it's the same amount of diffraction just happens at a different point. <clears throat> that's why two beams don't mix until they travel a few centimeters. Okay, that's your claim. So you're saying a few centimeters. So you're saying that at some point, if I go closer, see the problem is that you'll, if you go closer to the two slits, so let's say this is the two slits here. Um, if you go really close, the pattern hasn't diverged, obviously. So it's really, really small, and you can't see it, theoretically. That's always been the problem. But, I mean, it's always there. No matter what distance you go to, you'll find the pattern. So I, I don't think anyone's demonstrated your argument that at, say, three centimeters, there's no pattern. Another thing I think is interesting, at least I've been finding um, every time I play around with this stuff, is the uh, the fact that the images are reversed so there is this this lensing idea is actually happening somewhere you know where the pattern is getting you know this arrow ends up being duplicated like reversed so that's happening and i don't exactly know why because there shouldn't be a focal length so this would be the <coughs> the focal length but the beam diverges so little, um, I don't understand why there would be a focal length, the actual beam. I'm saying the, the fact that the light spreads, um, oh, yes, uh, from, from being bent. But once it's, once it's bent, it shouldn't be lensing. It shouldn't be crossing over. So that part's a little hard to understand. But it also makes it interesting in terms of it's another factor to consider is that if you're seeing, if something diffracts this way and you're actually seeing it on the other side, so the image is backwards. But I don't know how that focal length could be at the target, but it would have to be at the target. But it might be creating a focal length. That's why, that's why apertures are called lenses. So it's called lensing. But anyway, it is interesting. All right, just by the fact that I blocked one of the beams and the double slit pattern is not appearing shows that the interference pattern does not come from the slits. So the simple, instead of showing his drawings, what he's, this is, this is sort of the, 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 the pattern he displays the double slit pattern so basically gets it correct lines 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 so it goes from light to dark and then there's lines inside of it so he he's getting this pattern correctly so he's getting a traditional double slit pattern and then when he blocks okay by putting a barrier halfway across this fan so halfway across, he puts a barrier. He gets instead just the just the the single slit pattern, the single slit for a small aperture.
a small opening, which, um, by his what he says, how wide his slits are, which is more than a half millimeter, he should have a pretty. Um, he should have bars in the single slit pattern. He should have a single slit pattern that looks more like this. Well, let's do it right. Uh, you know, the bar uh, dots, lots of dots. So anyway, <coughs> but we'll have to see about that <laughs> when we do the experiment. But my my argument is is theoretically, um, you know, he's saying that if he blocks it here early, that he takes the bars out of the pattern. And um, I'm not disputing that doesn't happen. I'm just saying, what's your Huygens explanation for that? Because I don't think that makes sense from a distance perspective because there should already be this, oh, this slit should already interfere with this slit at whatever the distance apart this um, barrier is essentially that sort of dictates. So at twice the distance of this barrier, so at less than two millimeters, I mean tenths of a millimeter. Well this is, let's say this is a millimeter. So yeah, so two millimeters would be the maximum. I'm just trying to think of how, how many times you have, how far out you have to go before you've created these wavelets that are going to interfere with each other. But I'm just saying, draw me that Huygens picture. I mean, I could go back to just doing two slit images, which I suppose wouldn't hurt, but, you know, the traditional pattern. But I'm just saying the fan idea is established early. That's all I'm saying. Um, okay, uh, appearing to show, uh, let's see, double slit pattern is not appear shows, so he puts that in capital, that the interference pattern does not come from the slits. So again, what would be the argument if it didn't come from the slits? In the sense that it's, obviously it comes from the slits, um, I would argue. Um, but by your, your claiming that you can change the pattern by um, at a distance changing. So if you move it, if you move your, your block, your screen, um, say 10 centimeters away, does it still destroy the pattern? The argument I'm going to make is is the, the little bar pattern is a subtle pattern and that one's wiped out easily. That's, you know, the uh, just like in a um, interferometer. It doesn't take much alteration of the experiment to screw with that and so maybe you're not seeing it because its focal length isn't right now. It has to be at the right distance. I don't know. After, like I said, well, I have to do the experiment. It's, you have to vary things and find out what's causing the effect. All right, the Huygens principle was guessed as a principle only in a historical context. I don't even know what that means. You, you know, only in a historical context. It's, it's you know, Oh, oh, you mean that's how it originated? Oh, 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 oh. Later on, people like Kirchhoff and friends, whatever that is, found out that you can derive this from the wave equations as a mathematical consequence. We'll go ahead and do that with a water wave. So you're saying the wave equations contain Huygens built into them. The argument is, if I take two slits in water, I don't get this pattern. I just get bars. Bar, 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 bar. That's all I get, and they and they just get dimmer as you go farther away. So the distance between them remains the same, except obviously, if you're against a flat surface. So if you're taking a pattern going against a flat surface, obviously these distances change. So this one will be spread. So unless you if, if you don't curve the surface you're projecting it on, you won't get equal proportions. But so you will get some lengthening of the distance between the light and dark the further away you go. But the point is, is the water wave math is just a diminishing pattern. It gets weaker and weaker as it goes further away, but these distances, at least in the curve, would remain the same. Um, so it's not like this pattern. So you're saying you can derive this pattern 
um, is somehow built into wave uh, uh, a derivation of wave mechanics comes up with that well I don't think it does all right um, you don't even know what the wave equation is well yeah I know it's just this stupid thing where you take the distance so, so you can keep saying I don't know that's your prerogative I, I it's not my expertise but I can follow along enough to say uh, the, the sign of theta, the angle of difference, um, I know that stuff, and it's really all just calculated based on the distances. So the width of the slit, the distance to the target, um, there's not all that much in there, and the wavelength of the light. So what are you saying I don't understand, asshole? Um, I, I know it's made out of simple variables. There's no trick variable. That there's no Huygens factor in the mathematics. So you can keep claiming Huygens has something to do with the mathematics. Huygens has something to do with before you do the mathematics. It has to do with that sine theta. Fuckhead. It has to do with the fact that you made two photons out of one photon. One photon goes in. Two things come out. That's Huygens. All right? That's not math. That's, that's making something. That's creating a premise to the creation of these two entities that have spherical wave functions. So all of a sudden now light is a single point source radiating in all directions. A photon is. That's Huygens. So I don't think you understand the difference between the conceptual premises that underlie formulas. That first you have to accept where the sine theta comes from. The theta. Um, all right. So what the fuck makes you think you have any privilege to call any of this contrived? Well, I already explained what gives me the authority. The authority comes from the fact that every single popular physics video, every single video accessible on the internet, mischaracterizes this pattern and the mathematics that constructs their prediction of it, of the wrong pattern. They predict this pattern. They predict the water wave pattern. They don't predict the light pattern. Every single video. You can't take me to a video on the internet that demonstrates otherwise. You instead had to sit there and cut and paste your little crappy math where we do one formula and then we do a second formula to fix our first formula. But there's no formula. You don't have a formula that does it right. Um, and you certainly don't have a single video you can point me to where a qualified physics uh, person, a degreed physicist, is true to the facts. Show me the video that explains the two-slit experiment true to the facts. This is your claimed nail in the coffin evidence and yet this nail in the coffin evidence, this so clear it's it's you know glass, you can see right through it, how, this is perfect, this, this makes it all visible and yet they can't honestly describe it. And I'll say honestly, let's just say they can't accurately describe the experiment to save their fucking lives. If I force them to honestly describe it, they can't do it. Because whatever crap they come up for the two-slit experiment, it's going to fuck up the one-slit experiment. <laughs> so no matter, and then if I get them to honestly describe the single-slit experiment, they'll fuck up the double-slit experiment. Because you can't apply the same rules to the same, to both experiments. And I've already pointed that out. And I pointed out physicists doing exactly that. Just changing the world, rules. Two slits, well, then we'll just think of them as two single point sources. One slit, well, we'll think of it as an uh, infinite number of point sources. I mean, I've pointed it out. You won't concede the point, so there's no, what's the argument? I, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to argue with what your conventional physics that you're defending is saying. So why don't you tell them to say it right? Why don't you tell the physics professors to say it right? instead of telling me I'm wrong. Tell them to say it right first, asshole. Just run the fucking wave equations. You don't even need Huygens there. Liar. 
the wave equation will not get you this. It will get you this. So, so right there is just a grotesque lie. The math won't show you what the two-slit experiment does with light. And that I've already demonstrated by showing the math and showing the pattern it creates. And it doesn't in any way account for this inside the single slit pattern. Without Huygens, it has no chance. Again, what's your theory? Let's say it's not Huygens to create. See, see, see that's the trick they use. They, they claim that one photon, to go through the two slit experiment, one photon comes in and something splits in two, but it's not Huygens. Well, see, we know in water what's happening. Okay, we know the water wave is one big wave. It breaks into two pieces. Okay, and the individual pieces experience friction, which I don't think anybody would think a light has, and that's what bulges the wave. That's what turns the flat wave into a bulged wave. We know it's friction. Do you think it's something else that bulges the wave? It's under tension. There's friction. The one piece is moving slower than the other pieces, and it bends. Is there some other truth when it happens in water waves? So what's your physical explanation? I mean, you know, you keep pointing to this math. Well, your math has to have a physical explanation to go with it. You have to be able to draw a diagram of how this happens. What's your theory of how it happens? I don't care if you just call it the magic force, but you have to account for what happens. The single photon turns into two things. The two things turn into bulge waves and yet the wave equation won't get you the right pattern. It won't do this. Water waves don't do that. Alright. Just run the fucking wave equation again. No. Show me. <laughs> uh, you know. Alright. Talking about the wrench and laser is just going to detract from everything. But we'll see. Well, again, I, they're two important subjects, so, you know, you can't handle that in a separate comment. I'm sorry. But, yeah, I'm going to keep bringing it up until you come up with the reason the two have your, your duplicity of saying, well, yes, photons have mass and they can move in two directions, just like a wrench in space. And then, but somehow the wrench, if the guy misses it, it goes away at a higher speed and somehow the photon doesn't once it leaves the frame. They are both handled the same way by the velocity addition formulas though. They can't be. It's impossible for you to handle them the same way because of the vector math. So you can't, it's just a lie to say they're handled the same way. The vector math says that the wrench has two velocities, okay, x and y. And when you add them up, okay, you're going to get a, high, uh, 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 a hypotenuse. And the hypotenuse is the new velocity. That's going to be the new velocity. So, so the velocity this way and the velocity this way will add up to this hypotenuse of the new velocity. So this line will be longer than this line, and it'll be longer than this line. But it'll be a lot less than these two lines added up. And that's the velocity the wrench moves at. That's its real velocity. So, you know, to tell me they are both handled the same way by the velocity addition formulas, though. No, they're not. So, so that's just a lie. I mean, that's just nonsense. Because clearly the photon, in your opinion, doesn't leave faster than any of the two velocities. God damn it. This over and over again. All right, so this asshole, Jesse... Pig cun pin cumin. Anyway, so he posted a link to this stupid meat crap from MIT, right? This I'm not loading it on my computer. But anyway, this visualization software based on formulas that are still incomplete. So what's the point? I mean first the idea of MIT not being able to make software that is convertible to web applications, that is, that could actually just play in browsers. I mean the fact that they can't convert it to flash or they can't convert it into just images is pretty idiotic. I mean, it's pretty lame for a college, a scientific college. You think they have enough computer scientists to know how to write the software on platforms that exist on the internet. 
Um, so that's my first critique. Um, but again, what's the point when you see what their their math is doing? So, so I'm just saying, why couldn't you? Why can't you use your MEEP software and just show me the image? Show me the image of them putting the numbers in the slits. So the two slits are a half a millimeter thick. The single pen pediments a, a millimeter thick, um, and this is the two slit pattern you get. Um, and there's this many bars in it. And you know, why can't you tell me all that? Why can't you? Do, why can't you just use the software and then show me the image they produce for you, if it's so brilliant? Oh, that's right, because you can't do any of that. That's why. It, this is just, uh, uh, I don't even know, what, it's not a straw man. It's the, the made-up evidence fallacy. You're just making up the fact that it does something it doesn't do. All right, asshole. Someone read his comment. You are forgetting, uh, might as well, that, that the model uh, Lewin presented is an approximation. So you didn't pay any attention, really, to the argument being made. Right? Yeah. I wasn't arguing with Lewins, okay? I was arguing with the guy at Yale. He's the guy who's, who's talking about the single point sources. Lewin does Huygens in both experiments. So I'm not arguing with Lewin. I'm arguing with the guy at Yale in terms of claiming in the double slit their single point sources. So that's not even, you can't even get the, the, you can't even get the argument right. Lewin's the guy who says it's not diffraction, asshole. That's what I use Lewin to point out. Um, Lewin also doesn't do the math that creates the math for this pattern. Okay, <laughs> he does the math at just, you know, double slit, traditional double slit. That doesn't mean uh, the more complicated math doesn't exist. Well, again, I'm not arguing it doesn't exist. The ar fundamental argument is that this is supposed to be nail in the coffin evidence. This is supposed to be brilliant evidence. This is supposed to be so great evidence. Great, great, great. And I'm just saying, then how come your physicists can't honestly describe it? So how come they're taking shortcuts? And shortcuts that are catastrophically inaccurate. I mean, they're just not accurate. Uh, you know, to call it a single point source is just bullshit. The slits are pretty wide. <laughs> They're just as wise they are in the single slit. It's not a single point source. It's not a kind of, it's not a reasonable approximation. And it's only using, they're only doing it because they have to. Because if they don't do it that way, they'll have four point sources. If they do the math the same way they do it in a single slit, they'll end up with four waves interfering with each other. And you want that. Um, doesn't exist. Well, again, that's not my claim, asshole. I'm, I'm not claiming they can't contrive. Like I said, certainly I could do it. I mean, if you, I, you know, we know what the, the basic idea is. So I could do this math and get this wave pattern. And then I know it's going to fall inside the single slit pattern. So I could just create a second formula to subtract from the first. And I'll get the same result to create these nulls in here. These big, these are the real key thing. These, these are darks here. These are dark bands. And this is what the math doesn't account for. These are double, triple darks. You could call these 3x darks. You know, big, giant dark bands in the middle of your um, pattern. And that's what they don't account for. But certainly you could create mathematics, a second formula, and just subtract from your, the results of your first one. But again, that's just contriving. That's, that's not a, that formula isn't predicting. That formula is designed based on what you know the results to be. You're just creating math to create your results. Very different than making predictions. All right. Um, you've had the more complicated math pointed out many times. Well, you can keep saying I have, and I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any model that says this is the pattern, this is what it looks like, this is what the math comes up with. All I've seen is these silly derivations that end up with something like d squared sine theta xy equals 1 or some kind of crap like that. Why don't you actually do the math? Show me, a do a prediction <laughs> and predict how many bars are inside this. Show, tell me how exactly how many bars are going to be inside this middle pattern. Go ahead. Tell me, at, at, at what wavelength light, at, and, and you tell me how many bars are going to be with a slit of a single, uh, uh, slits of a certain 
uh, thickness and a middle impediment of a certain thickness. And show me the math that does that. Asshole. Um, the full model predicts both interference and diffraction. So again, I, I can only argue that Professor Lewin at MIT states emphatically there's no diffraction. There's interference. There's no, there's no such thing. Diffraction has nothing to do with the on-off pattern. If the slit widths are small enough, well, again, the, the argument is that they're plenty big enough. We can make them any size. And the argument is is the math basically says you're still going to get the pattern if I make them five feet. I can make the slits five feet wide. No problem. I'm still going to get a pattern from the single impediment. The diffraction pattern is much smaller than the interference pattern. So again, he's still going to argue that this is a diffraction pattern, the, the envelope, and that this is the interference pattern. But the truth is, if you do the single slit experiment, as you spread this pattern out, I, I, I mean you bring it in, this turns into the bars. Lots of bars. Single slit has lots. You, I, I did the other day 40 bars. 40. 40. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's little lines. Just have to make the slit wide enough. Lots of little lines. There's nothing diffraction in here. Um, it is much, much smaller than the interference pattern. And that's why the approximate formula is good enough for most purposes. Well, again, it's really not good enough. And you're not dealing with the, the fact that, you know, this is a, this, it's significant that these two patterns are blended into each other. They're manifestly inside of each other. That's, there's a dark spot here. It's not a little bit light. It's a dark, a full dark. <laughs> the two patterns are blended the two interference patterns are blended. The single slit interference and the double slit interference. It's two patterns blended. Yeah. Anyway, that's why the, uh, it's good enough for most purposes. Well, again, for nail in the coffin evidence, I don't think you should be using approximations that have, are not, don't approximate the reality at all. Uh, but the full version exists. Okay, says you. Again, another assertion. And if you want to argue that the interference is actually just Newton's rings, well, it certainly is in the single slit. The single slit experiment is just Newton's rings. I mean, you can pretend it's something else, but that's all the fuck it is. All, all you've done is taken a circular, you know, a, a bullseye pattern, and all you're really doing is cutting it. And then calling this a dark, this a light, this a dark, this a lot. It's an it's the same pattern. It's exactly Newton's just cut. You just cut off this extra bit. But that's all the single slit pattern is. It's Newton's rings. You just narrowed how what part you're viewing. You've just cut it. It's Newton's rings made linear. You you've taken the circle out of it. How how is it anything different than that? Why don't you demonstrate how it's different than that? That how that isn't the truth that you're just taking a cross-section of a Newton's ring. You know what a cross-section is? Well, that's all it is. The single slit experiment is just a cross-section of Newton's rings. Do you have a counter-argument that that's not the truth? Uh, let's see. Anyone or, uh, <coughs> Newton's rings, you could test this very easily. I don't need to. The, the math is the same. Just make a double slit pattern and cover one of the slits. So, so again, his argument is that somehow if I cover one of the slits, I'm going to not have a pattern. And of course I'm going to. If you, if you are correct that the interference is actually the exact same thing you'd see in the single slit case, you should see the same pattern regardless. The same pattern is what? The double slit and the, and the single slit are two different patterns because there's two projections. There's two projectors. So I don't know how exactly there's two point sources and there's only one point source in the other one. There's only one thing creating pattern and there's two in the other thing. And again, how does, 
what's your argument? I'm not claiming there's no pattern. That's how they describe it. That's how your physicists describe it, as there being no pattern. I'm claiming there will be a pattern from the single slit. You cover one slit, you'll still have a pattern from the single slit. If you're correct, the interference is actually the exact same thing you'll see with the single slit case. Exactly. Yes, exactly. You should see the same pattern regardless. I don't know what regardless means. If, if you're superimposing two patterns, that is you have two slits next to each other, my argument is, is that they're influencing each other electro, um, electrically. So you're changing how the electrons are distributed through the, through the materials. When you bring two slits close to each other and make that thin impediment in between, it's like charges. If I move charge plates, if I took charge plates and did the same thing, you'd understand how the charge changes on the thing in the middle. So if I bring plates together, I change the voltage in those two slits. And I make the slits wider, I change the voltage. The voltage changes. The potential changes. So I'm arguing you can't bring two slits next to each other without them affecting each other. But if one of them is blocked and no light can go through it, it's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, materially, what matter um, is, you know, when, when is it energized by the photons? Do the photons make the charge relevant or where the electrons are? I don't think so. But it's a valid question as to the density of the matter. So it might relate to the fact that he gets different results when he blocks some portion because maybe he's changing the charge field. So the more you move matter, so that the trick would be is to move something material before the light gets to the slit. So that's an experiment I'll play with. Move. So, so your laser beam is a nice narrow beam which makes it easier to do. So yeah, move matter, pieces of matter close to the slits and see if that changes the pattern. Maybe worth trying anyway. Um, all right, so anyway, I don't, I, regardless, this, the, the same pattern regardless doesn't make any sense. But of course you won't test this just like you won't test anything. So more assertions by you. So these claims that I won't test something, I have to be able to get a pattern first, you know, the good one. You, you, I guess you don't understand how, if you're going to bother doing something, you ought to do it right. Well, I've done some lots of single slit experiments. I used razor blades, used lots of different things, and the patterns sucked. Okay, there wasn't nice clear bars, none of that stuff. So until I get my instrumentality to cooperate, um, yeah, you're going to have to wait. Because I'm not going to publish crappy results, idiot. Cunt. Liar. Slandering. Useless liar. One of the reasons we know affinity is more than just useful construct is because of the remarkable precision with which we have been able to test Lorenz invariance. So again, he's saying he has tested Lorenz in any kind of realistic way when we can't make anything go near these speeds and measure anything relevant to stuff moving that fast. But he just claims it. They still can't get figure out how heavy an electron actually is and he's claiming they've done these speed tests on, you know, these particles. Bullshit. Um, as far as evidence shows, space-time is continuous. I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? Space-time is continuous. Oh, oh you mean the, <laughs> the, the fake perception goes forever? <laughs> you know, because that's all we're really talking about is perceptions, not actualities. I mean, all the thought experiments relevant to this are all based on points of view. It's not really who gives a shit about what's continuous. We know the points of view see things differently. And we know only one thing happened, jackass. We certainly know that space does not consist of little chunks of space. Oh, it's bent, though. You know that. And who, who's arguing it's full of little chunks of space? I've never called them chunks of space. So, again, you want to call matter chunks of space? Well, go ahead. I've never argued that it's chunks of space. It's obviously something 
different than space. It's obviously something different than nothing. Something is different than nothing. I'm claiming photons are made of something. Your claim is the one that there's some kind of perturbation in a field, some kind of electromagnetic field, so two fields, an electrical field and a magnetic field. That's your argument, chunky. I bet you are fat. It is not at all, it is not at all like the pixels of a computer monitor. Again, I'm the one arguing that space is nothing and that the stuff is flying in space is something. The stuff moving the speed of light is not nothing. It's not space. That's why I called it tons. It's because it's something, not nothing, idiot. This means space is a continuum, says you. Based on what? I mean, he says this means, based on my false assumptions, <laughs> the topology and continuum, whatever that even means, continua, is a non-empty, compact, connected, whatever that means, metric space. Oh, well, isn't that nearly perfect bullshit? So why don't you, what, you get lessons from Ken Wheeler? A non-empty, compact, connected, metric space. Uh, one of those pesky word games involving infinities. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I, I really, you know, again, you want to think that the, the real physics is in finding, in declaring the non-entities to have functions. So space has functions. The nothing has functions. It tells matter what to do. The, the magnetic field and the electric field tell, okay, objects whether they're magnetic or not magnetic. And they push them around with the magnetic field woo power. Calling quantum mechanics a religion because you personally find the idea repugnant. Now, I find all this dishonesty of this crooked language and these propositions based on so weak an evidence. So you're, you're claiming an absolute truth based on un not significant evidence, all right? Not great evidence. So it's like the UFO theory of people. You get a little tiny evidence, a little, oh, crop circles, blah, 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 and you sit there and run with it. And I'm saying, you haven't got enough evidence to run with your bent space. That a photon sometimes acts like a wave and sometimes like a particle is nothing more than your personal bias. No, it's a bias against a silly idea. It's in, incomprehensible as a wave anyway because every wave I've ever encountered has been in a medium under tension so you're the one claiming there's a space ether because there has to be something under tension the only way something travels a wave travels is because the thing it's traveling through has it's rubber bandy it has to have a it has to have flex um, it has to be under tension the things have to be um, mechanically tied to each other by some kind of force. There has to be force in there. And I'm saying you don't have any explanation, and I do. I found the tension. The tension is <laughs> created by the fact that there's two polarizations of quanta, two kind, um, and they can be filtered. And it can create every force known to mankind. That is, it can create the strong force that exists between the electron and the proton. It can create uh, uh, weaker forces like gravity that are diluted but forms of the same thing um, and explains magnetism. So all of them are describable just by creating two kinds of quanta and just changing and just give them two different two qualitative different just A and B, X and Z, whatever you want to call them, black and white. Something that simple and then once you create mechanisms that can filter for the, that simple, you create your own off patterns. Asshole. All right. Uh, word games involving infinity. So again, I'll, I'll reassert my claim that nothing, um, nothing meaningful will ever be connected to your theory of double infinity. It's silly math. It's a waste of time. It's just a, it's a math game. And again, you can play silly games with these silly words. You can have people come into a courtroom and say, I promise 
to lie every time I'm lying or some kind of crap like that. You can have some, you can say all backwards and stupid and convoluted, or you can just be upfront and say, there'll never be a circumstance where a double infinity is relevant. Calling quantum mechanics a religion because, <clears throat> anyway, science is supposed to eliminate personal biases out of your epistemology, ontology. And again, you're the one claiming you don't have any bias. I'm claiming the evidence is hugely weak and you're jumping on a bandwagon. You won't even admit your physics has been sloppily presented, I mean, grotesquely inaccurately presented to the public, um, dishonestly, and <laughs> frankly, and, and uh, you're not a religion. Well, yes, you are. You're not biased. Yes, you are. You have a bias for this crap because the evidence is weak. Uh, for instance, A equals a light wave that acts just like a wave and happens to be traveling through a medium. They don't act just like a wave. They don't spread like a wave. They, they don't land like a wave proportionally over a great deal of distance. So it has no, pro no, it has nothing, it's nothing like a wave. No wave we know of this particle wave. B, light is a particle and behaves like a particle, whatever that means. Oh, you mean it's discrete and it lands discrete. It leaves discrete, it lands discrete. It doesn't spread uh, or any of that crap and it just happens to have a frequency. That is, you can shoot bullets at a frequency and maybe some idiot will call it a wave of bullets, but the bullets aren't really waving. C, light is a particle whose location is not fixed prior to measurement. So again, it's a thing, a particle, but it doesn't know where it is. It's floating around in some probability sphere of uncertainty. And you think that certain certainty is absolute, and you somehow got evidence that it's absolute. I make the counter argument that it just happens to be that the smallest thing in the universe, the thing we can't see, the thing we have no tool to measure because it's so small, we have no instrument, we can't make a measuring device because it's too damn small, we can't cut the little lines in the ruler because we have nothing small enough to cut the lines in the ruler. And just coincidentally, the one thing in the universe that's the smallest thing in the universe and we can't look at just happens to be the one thing in the universe doing this I don't know where I am bullshit. Everything else in the universe knows where it is, except no, not this thing. And that doesn't sound conveniently, <laughs> you know, fuck you, so convenient. But instead follow a, lot, a probability distribution that matches the way waves propagate. Again, no, waves don't propagate that way. They don't. There's nothing uncertain about where waves go. There's nothing uncertain about how they spread. So there's no uncertainty about positions. So wave has nothing to do with probability. Sorry. Uh, this is your bias in the photon should either do or A or do B and not C. It's not a bias. I'm saying first it's logical that the universe is simpler, not more complicated. I'd argue that whatever your infrastructure is that's creating this unknown space, it has to have some sort of rules because obviously it keeps things in containers. They're, they don't, photons don't go to Pluto, bounce back and go through slits. I mean, this shit doesn't happen. Uh, but the bias is due to your heuristic conception of the world. I don't know what that even means, but fuck it. Uh, your brain as you would be, well, you're, you're an idiot who thinks Donald Trump is smart, so you're an idiot. Your brain as you would be the first to point out is engineered by evolution to be a scheming survival mechanism. And what does that have to do with this subject? Oh, nothing. And part of the, and part of that means the brain has to think fast to make decisions. Now, there's nothing fast thinking about this. I've spent five years now at least. Um, messing with this bullshit, so fuck you, um, promote survival in the long run. Um, so again, that has nothing to do with what's taking place here, shithead. Uh, but this mode of operating is not very conductive to solving complex problems involving logic. So he puts logic, quantum physics, or the nature of abstract things like infinity. First of all, infinity isn't abstract. Okay, it's just it's just unresolvable. You can't look at one and you can't calculate one. But there's nothing abstract about it. It's not a distortion. It's not a compilation. It's not uh, in any way abstract in that sense. 
it's clearly an explicit thing mathematically. It has an explicit definition and consequence mathematically. So it's not an abstraction, in my opinion, if it exists. Uh, quantum physics, I mean, clearly in Maxwell equations, an infinity has a strong and certain and complete effect. There's nothing abstract about its effect. These things take painstaking work to even begin understanding. Well, I've already, I've already defined my credentials here, and I'm really not, I don't have any obligation to sit there and keep um, accepting these kinds of gratuitous insults. You think you're smarter than me. You think you know better. You think you've studied more. You think you've seen, uh, are, uh, you know, that, that you've interact with more physics in your life than I have. I'm arguing, no, you, you haven't, and, to, and this isn't about your credentials, fuckhead. So these silly arguments that somehow I'm missing something, when you can't even acknowledge the simplest truths, which are first, that you should be at least be willing to say physics shouldn't be um, mischaracterized for the sake of propaganda, that they should be honest, in presenting the truth of the double slit experiment and what it represents as evidence. Anyway, why should you expect the brain to easily comprehend the nature of reality? Well, because I think the nature of reality is easy and simpler. Uh, again, there's nothing. <laughs> Go look at the universe. Take a telescope and look out there. And you tell me what you think is complex about it. It's, it's fucking, it's pretty damn simple chemistry. There's nothing bizarre happening out there much. So you want to pretend that it's complicated? No, it's not complicated. The big universe ain't complicated. The little universe isn't complicated. The only thing that's complicated is apparently communicating with fuckheads like you. Um, whenever you find yourself getting angry about difference of opinion, be on guard. You will probably find on examination that your belief is going to be fucking beyond that, what the evidence warrants. Bertrand Russell, religious kook. Uh, the real philosopher of science, a uh, real philosopher of science, in your opinion, not mine, so I don't care. So your this quote means what? Oh, that's right, it doesn't mean anything. It's evidenced by what? Oh, that's right, there's no evidence that this happens all the time or any of this shit. And then he types a bunch of gibberish, and it says, James Joyce, someone who makes about as much sense as your Ton theory. So, my Ton theory doesn't make sense. For what reason? So, I've been asking you people to disqualify my theory by pointing out how my theory actually is disqualified. What, what it predicts, or what it states, takes place that makes it impossible for it to be correct. You haven't done any of that. How exactly could tons not explain gravity. I've pointed out how it's exactly the same as mock gravity, and I've explained to you why I get rid of the side effect that they disqualified it by. They didn't disqualify it because it doesn't explain gravity, that it doesn't exactly duplicate the inverse square law and all of the mechanics of gravity. No, it got disqualified because it creates another problem, which is it creates a, a thermodynamic problem. Things can't travel through the ton field um, without being affected by the tons. Well, now I've explained why they're not affected, why electrons do lose momentum, okay, and protons do lose momentum. You have to keep pushing them to keep them going. They won't just travel, you can't make them go with speed and just they keep going. You can't make an electron gun that shoots electrons 500 yards. You can't do it. Um, and I've explained that the only things that can keep momentum or velocity are material objects. So, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, because of the complex force that's trapped inside of them. The, the 